technology. Let's learn out about it, all about it from Becky Stern. Can you see me? I can't really see you. There's a microphone in my face. Um, it's, it's nice to see you. I'm going to try to shorten my talk and I'll still allow room for questions at the end. Um, hi, everybody. If you don't know me, um, my name is Becky Stern. I'm the director of wearable electronics at Adafruit Industries, a DIY electronics kit company uh, here in New York City. It's okay. And um, we make parts and sensor breakouts and tutorials and source code for makers and hackers to build their own technology and mod the stuff they already have. But my passion is combining electronics and crafts uh, to make unexpected, useful, self-expressive, um, and mischievous wearable electronics. Are you good there? But in addition to making stuff with electronics, I'm no stranger to using fashion as a hacking tool for culture. Um, this is a project I volunteered on called Wall Suits, where uh, we, you know, we brought a whole bunch of donated business suits for men and women to Zuccotti Park for the Occupy Wall Street protesters, and we offered uh, haircuts and um, a changing booth to, um, you know, transform their look so that their appearance might be more palatable to those they wished to affect, uh, so their message would be more likely to be heard. And there's me, there's me down in the corner there at the, um, at the pants hemming, hemming station. So to me, the definition of, of disruptive wearable technology is the application of science that, that disturbs or interrupts an activity. I'm not so, t not so much talking about the definition of disruptive that means like groundbreaking, um, or innovative, because obviously most of these things will already do that, but the ones that interrupt um, or disturb. They can, um, you know, disruptive wearable tech can solve some problems, uh, you know, probably by creating some problems. If you took the subway here, maybe something like this could have helped you. And the, the projects I'm going to share with you today cover like the last 10 years of um, the creative use of technology that impacts culture um, things that you wear on your person. This is the creative misuse of some anti-bird technology from the garden store um, implemented by a, um, a student in Singapore named Su Ming Cheng. I think that wearables have the potential to inspire us, protect us, express ourselves, and give us real life superpowers. Um, and a lot of that uh, hacking the body culture comes from our favorite place, MIT. Um, up here we've got Steve Mann with, you know, some people call him, whether you agree with it or not, the grandfather of Google Glass, Leah Beakley, the inventor of the Lily Pad Arduino, Aya Badir, founder of Little Bits, and my boss, Lamore Freed, who, you know, in her spare time likes to make cell phone jammers. There's other places, a lot of academic places, but I think the main, the main place that a lot of this culture comes from is, is um, MIT, NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program. Lately, when I went through my slides, I was like, wow, there's a lot represented there. Um, and so we'll just dive right in. I'm going to show you a bunch of projects. And they're more or less in chronological order. We'll go take it back to 2005 from the old Afrotech Mods site. Raise your hand if you're a big fan. Yeah. Um, and um, <laughs> I had to fetch this from archive.org because the site's a lot different now. These are the Pika shoes. They have um, an ion generator in the sole of the shoe, and it helps you build up a static charge so that you can shock people by touching them. And they're not very, we're going to go through and see maybe things get a little bit more fashionable, and I'll talk about fashion at the end, but um, uh, these are definitely mischievous, right? And they're, they're useful and they give you that superpower, like Pikachu. It's hard to get these parts. I've, I've been told it's hard to get the ion generators now, so that's one reason you can't build this project yourself right now. But it is a how-to guide. This is Random Search by Aya Badir. It's her thesis project from MIT, and it's, um, it's an undergarment that records the location and pressure of the way you're touched during a secondary screening at the airport. And um, she, she did a lot of research to make this garment um, undetectable by x-ray so that she could wear it through the airport and not, you know, not be secondarily screened because of the project, but rather. Um, so she used um, some, those are conductive Velcro up there, and then these are the fabric sensors that um, she did to test there. Here, I have a little video. Oh, sorry, we'll play the video. Oh, teaser. So, you know, as, an, as a Middle Eastern woman, she felt extra targeted um, and then powerless uh, to, you know, complain if, if someone touched her inappropriately, and she was secondary screened, you know, all the time. Um, and so the, this garment gives her the power to track that misconduct. So you'll see that's a theme going through, that we have wearable electronics and technology can make us feel powerful. Here she is proving that it doesn't go off in the metal detector. Let's go ahead. 
So this is, um, this is one of two projects of my own that I put in, that I managed to weasel into my slideshow. This is the laptop Compu Body Sock. Maybe you've seen it before and you didn't know I made it. Well, because it's popular on the internet, but I made this. I knit it with my own two knitting needles. Um, it was made, I made it as a, as a sculpture, an art piece. I was in grad school um, and I wanted to sort of um, highlight the attention space that you have when you're using the computer, like nothing else matters. And, um, but the fun thing about art is that the meaning is whatever the viewer decides it is, right? And I'm, I'm big into that. Like, if whatever your interpretation of is art. So if you feel like you don't get art, you go to the museum. It's whatever you think it's about. And it's the artist's job to sort of, like, raise questions that make you get gears moving in your head. Um, and that means that once it's out there in the world, on the internet, like, commentary happens, you know? Like, I didn't think it was for porn, but I guess, I guess that's what it's for. But really when I made it, um, I, I wanted to, my fingers were cold and I was typing and I wanted to make a keyboard cozy and then I just like couldn't stop knitting. <laughs> um, I read an article actually that Edward Snowden uses something like this, like a big red hoodie to like cover his computer because then you can't see typing or like what's on your screen. This is my, my old roommate who's such a good sport. On our, we took a trip to Maker Faire and he modeled for me on the airplane. This next project is the iWriter. It's by uh, members of Free Art and Technology, or FAT. I'm also a member of that group, but I didn't work on this project, so it doesn't count as mine. Yeah, FAT love. Um, and it's the, the iWriter is a pair of eye-tracking glasses that let this paralyzed graffiti artist draw again. And um, that's, I think it's really powerful, and it's made with DIY tech, low-cost, stupid camera, IR LEDs, cheap plastic glasses. Um, and I have a little video about that. Oh, I didn't bring sound. We didn't bring sound with me. I forgot to tell them that I need sound. This is okay. It doesn't. It doesn't need sound because it's just music. You can hear it. It's just music. It's just oh, because of the microphone. It's just music. It gives me a little break. Okay, so you get it, right? So what they did then is they, um, they took his, his drawings and they used a giant projector to like live project his drawing onto a building and then um, they had like a, a video check going back to his hospital room so he could see his tags go up on a building for the first time since he was diagnosed with, or you know, since he um, became uh, paralyzed by his uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. So I think that that's, that's, a, that's super powerful, right? It's, it's a, this, this wearable, this low cost DIY tutorialized wearable technology has the power to improve the quality of life as we all live longer and, and our physical bodies fail us. Um, and that how-to guide makes it so that anybody can hack or extend or, or use this for their own purposes. This is the second of my own projects, I promise it's the last one. Um, and it's the TV Be Gone jacket. So uh, many of you guys probably know what the TV Be Gone is. It's a, um, a small electronic device that turns off all of the televisions. It's just a simple infrared remote. It was invented by Mitch Altman, who's here downstairs teaching an Arduino workshop right now. And, um, who, you know, he teaches all over the world. And then uh, also the kit was co-made by my boss, Lamora Freed, who's in the front row. And um, the, the kit, um, you put it together, it's a little handheld remote, right? And I would bring it, I was in grad school in Arizona, and there were TVs in every restaurant. And I don't just mean like just the chain restaurants, every restaurant. And, and I'm not talking about using this at a sports bar, but uh, you know, I'd go out to eat and bombarded by pixels. And, and like many people with ADD, I have trouble focusing on who's with me if there's like a lit screen in the room. So um, I would turn it off all the time, but like the wait staff would be like, what are you doing? And they'd see the TV turn off and they'd go and turn it back on, or they'd ask me not to eat there. That actually never happened. I never got kicked out for TV be goning. But, um, 
I wanted to make it more stealth and I didn't want to have these awkward interactions and you know if I like people weren't usually watching it so if, if I could get it to be off they wouldn't notice it was off until I after, after I left so I sewed it into the lapel of my sweatshirt and had the infrared LEDs pointing, pointing out the front and infrared lights invisible to the human eye so it just looks like rhinestones or whatever other studs you've got on your jacket and then um, the batteries in the pocket and then I used conductive thread to connect to the zipper and that acted as the switch. So when I would just come into a restaurant, I could, I could just unzip my jacket, hang out for a little bit, the device would be like Sony off, Samsung off, Panasonic off, and it would get to the code of those TVs, they'd turn off, I'd remove my jacket and enjoy my meal. I liked it so much I made it again into this black jacket, you see. Um, and I want all my jackets to be like this. And you can do that. There's a lot of wearable tech now that like they want you to try to wear this one thing all the time. And um, that's because it's still kind of expensive, but really like, you don't wear the same thing all the time. You always you wear different jackets. And the TV Be Gone is inexpensive enough that you could put it in all your jackets. There's a tutorial online. It also, um, it also gives you that stealth superpower, right? And, um, and scratches the mischievous itch. This is the anti-paparazzi clutch by Adam Harvey. He might be here, hey, if you're here. And um, I'm sharing a lot of his projects today. And what it does is it, um, it, it talk about giving agency over your physical space. This is for celebrities or other people who don't want their, their flash picture taken. Um, it has a high powered LED and a sensor to react to camera flashes, kind of like a slave flash if you're into photography. And um, it'll flash back and kind of obliterate your face. So you can kind of hold your purse up to your face and um, then make those images unusable by the very real, like physical, you know, paparazzi photographers are often quite aggressive. Um, and you know, like, this isn't a DIY project. He doesn't offer instructions. In fact, you can't even really see what it's made out of in these pictures, right? You can't even see that it's a purse. Um, and, and while I wish he'd make more tutorials, I do think that this has um, a, a huge cultural impact because it creates celebrity appeal, right? And we, we worship celebrities, and even if we don't worship celebrities, we, they're, the things that are appealing to them are forced into our daily lives all the time through media. Um, and I think that's important because it makes people see that fighting tech with tech is an option. And they might be inspired to, to, to try that themselves. If you, if you went to Greg Horton's surveillance talk yesterday, this is the only slide we have in common. Um, <laughs> this is the CV Dazzle, which is Adam Harvey's ITP thesis project. Um, it's fit, hair and makeup that uh, makes you undetectable to facial recognition software. So, you get surveilled and then that footage gets, gets put through uh, some facial recognition software to sort of identify the people, match them up to certain time steps, match them up to a different database to identify who they are, like uh, establish continuity when there's multiple security cameras in a space. Um, they can use facial recognition software to say like, oh, okay, then he went to camera four. Um, and um, it uses like the bridge of your nose and the position of your eyes, the, sy the symmetrical, symmetricality of your um, symmetry of your face to um, detect whether or not you're a face or not a face. And so he found out that if you styled your hair in a certain way and you put asymmetrical makeup on that your face can't be detected by the facial recognition software. This is the top picture is an op-ed that they did in the New York Times about his work. Um, and I, I think that that's, it's, it's really interesting because this, this stuff that blocks your, your facial recognition, it looks a lot like this, <laughs> right? And this is just personal expression. So like if this could be, like if you saw someone wearing this down the street, you might think that they're just like this, but maybe they're like trying to hide from surveillance cameras. And I think that's, it's really cool that you could, that there's an invisibility to it, even though it's of course very visible. Um, it, it, it could pass for something that's culturally like okay right now, which I think is really neat. Um, and finally, you know, I can get that like bridge of the nose piercing and explain to my mom that like, no, no, it's cool. Like just put a feather in it and then like the, the cameras can't see me, mom. That's why I got it. <laughs> it's my next one, my next facial piercing. This is the no contact jacket and there's a video. It also has sound, but the sound's not that important.
So this is created by Adam Witten and Yolita Nugent, and it's it's obviously a prototype. Um, I don't think it ever made to market. A lot of these things, that if they try to make businesses out of it, like this, would probably investors would see huge liability, I'm sure. But it's it's got that it's got that um, that inspirational thing, right? Um, and it gives you a superpower, makes you feel powerful in an otherwise powerless situation. Because, you know, if you have, like, um, this problem with stun guns and pepper spray, you have to be able to wield it at the right moment, right? So this, this kind of, like, gives you a sense of security when you feel vulnerable. Uh, this is the Emergency Amulet by uh, Kiveli Venzani, who's also an NYU ITP student. And um, it calls 911 when you break the glass vial. Similar to the previous one, it help, you know, helps you call for help. Um, and, and feel like you've got this physical representation of something safe. People often wear like a cross around their neck, right? I'm not one of those people, but like it, it gives you, people wear things that, that have symbolic um, meaning to them, and this has a symbolic meaning that like if you ever needed it, it could help you out. So now we get into anti, anti, more anti-surveillance. Um, this is the CCD Me Not Umbrella by Mark Shepard. And um, so, Security cameras, they, the, the software they run the images through, they're looking for faces, but they're also looking for people, right? Like, it, like they don't want to bookmark video points that's just birds. They want to see, like, if there's a person coming and going, getting unauthorized access to some place. Um, so what this project does is it helps, you, it helps you obfuscate your human form and transform your silhouette on that security camera while also blotting out your face. Uh, again, infrared light's invisible to the human eye, so this is what it looks like in, you know, to you on the left, and this is what it looks like to a security camera on the right. Um, and here's another image of it from a security camera on the left there. And um, you can see how it, it totally, um, while it doesn't completely overwhelm the camera the same way that the, the flashy purse does, it, it does change the human silhouette, which might fool the software into not thinking it's a human and thinking it's just a, a bird or a car or, a, or something else they're not looking for. Um, there have been experiments with headbands with infrared LEDs, and boy, I really wish this worked. I really wish it did. I want to tell you that it works, but I'm going to show you a video that proves that it kind of doesn't. That's why the umbrella is a really better idea. This is uh, Randy Serafan a good friend of mine and member of Fat Lab as well, experimenting with, with infrared LEDs. There is no audio on this video, except at the end. He really wanted it to work too. You can see in his face, he's like, oh man, this one too. So it's not reliable, right? And the title of his blog post is, I included it for your amusement, wouldn't bet my life on it. And that's an interesting point because these, like, these security ones, like the necklace, right? I don't know that I'd bet my life on it. Yeah, they're on. This is just from that. I took, well, if it was a video, it was better. So it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. But what might work for uh, your, like, along with the umbrella, Greg brought up an interesting point yesterday that, or, or uh, sorry, a question, somebody asked a question in Greg's talk yesterday about, um, like, hiding the way you walk. So, like, uh, you could use this, you could use the umbrella to hide that you're a human form, but you should also maybe try to obfuscate your walk. And it made me think of this Monty Python sketch. So, I mean, it's a, funny, it's, it's a funny sketch, and, you know, it's from before we were talking about, it's definitely not anti-surveillance in mind, but it could work if you had the, the, the umbrella and the Ministry of Silly Walks, like, you invisible to security cameras. <laughs> Here's another Adam Harvey project, more recent one, called Stealthware, and it's, um, it's garments that hide your, your mid-wave infrared or your heat signature from surveillance drones, not cameras. We're not talking about you know, pr privacy of our identities, but, but sort of privacy that could protect our lives from, from a state-controlled threat. And that's why you see it sort of like, you see the, the burkas there be because of the, oh, well, sound, thanks. That'll come in handy. We have do one video at the end that has sound, so that's nice. 
And um, so, you know, it's culturally, okay. It's uh, like culturally, you know, he's trying to be culturally sensitive. To the, try to put it in, in perspective, uh, like make you understand where it's supposed to be used. Um, and we, we, we do realize that if thermal emissions are blocked, you, your body will overheat pretty quickly. Um, so it might not be suitable for like wearing for a long time and in all climates, but like maybe you need to go to the store. Um, you can see here this, the figure in the center of the frame is wearing the, the burqa and you can only see the heat signature on the legs. So quite effective for short periods of time. Uh, this is a collection called Wearable Solar by a uh, fashion designer named Pauline van Dongen. She's Dutch. And um, I don't know that it's just, it's not mischievous, it's not really devious in the way that some of these other projects are, but I think that um, presenting the idea of carrying your own energy source as, as a, a f like fashion and desirable and like it might even be sexy is, is pretty powerful and, and we haven't really seen a lot of that yet and I think we'll be seeing a lot more of it soon. Um, I don't know that I would wear a black jacket out in the sun, never mind long enough to charge my phone. But the, the fashionable presentation here is what's key because it's, it's culturally relevant. You're seeing that like, it's not just hackers and nerds, like this is, this is real fancy fashion. You can tell by her eyebrows. Uh, this is the CHBL Jammer Coat by um, Co-op Himmelblau, which is an Austrian architecture and design studio. And it's created for, like, for an exhibition. Um, and it's a, it is a commentary on data privacy. It's made with conductive uh, fabrics that block cell phone, Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth signals so that you can be sure that when your phone is off, your location is not actually being tracked, that none of your devices are being broken into. Um, and it keeps, keeps, it's a nice snuggly coat that keeps you scary from those, keeps you safe from those scary data thieves. And here's, a, here's another um, line of cell phone blocking clothes designed by Kunihiko Morinaga. Um, and you'd think it's also a commentary on data privacy, but it's, it's um, and like I'm all about EMF blocking fashion. Uh, but the, um, it was actually an advertisement uh, or, stint by Trident Gum, who thought that like if you spend all this time on your phone, you don't spend time interacting with your, your fellow people, and, and during that time when you're interacting with fellow people, you might be more likely to chew gum. <laughs> and I mean, I love the, I, I love the idea that, that the shiny aesthetic could become popular because it represents data privacy, so like, because it's hard to make conductive fabrics not shiny and still do the, do the job, so um, maybe material science is going to get there, but for now, like, I love that. I'm wearing shiny clothes because data privacy. Um, and I think that, that this type of thing is a palatable entry point for a lot of people who, um, who might even be not, like, not ready for this, to understand what this means. But they, do, they get this. They're like, I wear pants, I wear shirts, I wear dresses, although I don't see any pockets on this dress for your cell phone. And likewise, these are, these are cell phone blocking pockets, and there are a lot of them, both DIY guides. I did a DIY guide. Aaron Barthol in Germany did a, did a DIY guide. Adam Harvey did the off pocket. Um, and bef and um, before data privacy was, this, was the hot button issue, it was about cell phones, which are also a transformative and disruptive wearable technology, um, transforming our culture and um, interrupting it in a way we didn't anticipate. So, that's the, those are the two things, right? Like protect your privacy of your data and counteract the social interruption with an overt gesture, like this one on the lower right. It's, it says, my phone is off for you. And so I can imagine, you know, you, you, right before you sit down to dinner with your date and you wrap your phone in the handkerchief and you set it on the table and that, you know, that that like really makes it clear that you're interested in whatever dumb thing your date's cat's been doing. <laughs> So while these things can protect against data privacy and uh, or protect protect against pr protect your, your privacy of your data and and uh, make you feel like you're not being tracked or your camera's not filming you, um, and you know do this social gesture of like I'm paying attention to you I'm not paying attention to my phone. I think that in the future there's a, there's going to be a more imminent security threat with with this kind of. Um, block like more imminent need to block out signals from your body, not just from your phone, and and that's because I watched this really creepy video from Stanford um, where they're they're researching midfield wireless energy transfer. So like you know how inductive charging you can inductively charge your phone, it has to be really close. They're working on um, extending that distance a couple inches so that. Um, medical implants can be made a lot smaller and put the large bulky battery on the outside of your body. 
And the video talks about how you can, they can potentially cure Parkinson's or chronic pain by like putting these little implants on your nerves, place, or in your brain, places that were much too um, tight to, to put any implants or make implants before because they had these big bulky batteries. So I just, I'm a little nervous that you might need one of these coats to prevent someone from like hacking, like, you know, creatively misusing your body implants in the future. Because if you are known to have one of these and someone wants to mess with you, they could probably like hurt you pretty bad if they created a device that interfered, that used that mid-range wireless energy transfer to do something not so nice. Did you guys read Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson, science fiction book? They're all about nanotech and there's these nanobots and like when you get convicted of a crime, they inject these nanobots into your bloodstream and there's no fence on the prison. It's just that if you walk too far out beyond the beacons, all the nanobots explode at once. So like, could that jacket help you escape from that prison? Or similarly, descent, you know, fight back against the man. Here's my video that needs sound, so that came just in time. I've been told I'm supposed to keep it at three quarters. You may have heard this statistic in the news at some point. Every 26.2 seconds, a violent assault occurs in the United States. But did you know that almost half of those assaults go undocumented? And many documented cases are simply unprosecutable. Violent assault can happen anytime, anywhere. And no matter how prepared you think you are, effectively responding requires you to anticipate your attack. That's near impossible. So attackers go free. Emergency response times are long, and rarely is there evidence collected that can actually be used to close such a terrible chapter in someone's life. The good news is, this is about to make it possible for violent assaults to be documented. Looks like a hair clip, right? Well, look closer. What you don't see is a tiny high-tech sensor that is only triggered by the forces that create injuries. A Bluetooth signal emitting from the sensor that instantly turns on your smartphone microphone and camera. An app that immediately starts transmitting evidence to a monitoring station. And a monitoring station that is able to provide the quickest way to help by communicating exact GPS coordinates. But it's just a clip, right? Wrong. This is safety. This is security. This is proof. This okay, is that's about as much of that as I can take. <laughs> you guys are with me on that, right? Um, this is the first sign hair clip by uh, Rachel and Arthur Emanuel, um, now in partnership with Mace brand, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's like a funded Indiegogo that hasn't shipped yet, so we'll see if it actually, you know. But it's like an accelerometer and a Bluetooth module, just like that same device, you, the similar device you put on your my, mountain biking helmet when you go out mountain biking. We did an Adafruit teardown of that one. Um, this, this commercial makes me really uncomfortable. Did it make you guys uncomfortable? Because it uses fear in its marketing, right? And the idea that like, like, a violent assault could happen any time, buy our shit. <laughs> I think that's, it's, that's a little misguided, but the, um, and, and the idea that you don't need to know how it works, don't worry, the sensor's only activated with impacts that cause injury. Well, what is that, like a coder has to write that code, right, and coders make mistakes. Um, and I don't know, it's just, but it's a very interesting example of um, the way we really want wearable tech to make us feel safe. Um, and I would argue that we need to we need to fundamentally understand that technology a little more, uh, and that this is this is tough. This this that product is tough. I know when I'm shopping for hair clips, what I'm thinking about is documenting my violent assaults. Um, but I think that it's, it is easier to creatively misuse something that's popular and out there, right? Because there's more people with their hands on it, more people um, trying to use it for different purposes. This uh, this also has sound, but it's just. It's just Japanese song. Um, this is a, a Japanese toy company called uh, Takara Tomi Arts made uh, this this product um, called Lumi Deco Nail, and it's it's an uh, uh, an RFID or NFC tag or chip in uh, and an LED in a nail sticker. And you can buy these in Japan now. I would, I'm trying to find a place to order them online. I can't yet, but. Um, it's just fun for Japanese schoolgirls or whoever else wants to wear it. Um, but and like this commercial is presenting it as like, like isn't it so fun? Oh, sorry. Isn't it so fun uh, to have to have your uh, nails light up when you use your transit pass or when you're on the phone or or when you're like using an RFID door access card? Isn't that so cool? And 
I love that because the more cool it is, the more like outwardly cool people think this kind of stuff is, the more like fun stuff will happen in the future using this kind of technology. I think that if you replace it with an infrared LED, you could write an app that like when you go like this and flash it, it turns off the TVs, right? They have TV vegans on the brain all the time. I would like to do that. I put an RFID tag in my nail polish um, just to unlock my phone. Pretty fun. But my point is it's, it's easier to creatively use, misuse something that's popular. So I hope this becomes more popular. And this is the reason, right? I think that it's important for technology to present, be presented in a more fashionable context uh, so that it appeals to a broader audience. This is a Raspberry Pi uh, heads-up display, and this is Diane von Furstenberg wearing her Google Glass with her custom Diane von Furstenberg sunglasses. There's room for both of these things. And I think we need more designers to present technology in a way that makes you want to wear it to reflect your personal style. There's infinite personal styles, so that means there needs to be infinite wearable technologies to appeal to all of those styles. Because instead of a device you hold in your hand, wearable tech really, when you put something on your body, it says something about how you want to be seen in the world. So I think we're going to see stuff get less visible or more fashionable. So like we could have Google Glass, we could have like the Google Glass contact lens for firefighters who need their hands free. and um, and I hope we have more fashionable representations of things that make you really want to put them on your body. So I mean, I think that disruptive wearable tech has the potential to transform crime, give us, you know, make us feel like we're real life superheroes, and make our sensors work for us. Um, and when, when stuff becomes, you can tell something has, has critical cultural impact when there starts to be anti-it. Right, so this is just the glass hole script that kicks your, that you can put on your, like a Raspberry Pi or Beagle Bone to, on your network to detect and kick um, Google Glass from a Wi-Fi network. So if you had a store and you didn't want people to be sharing videos from your store, you could put this on your network and, and kick them off. So there's like wearable anti-tech and there's anti-wearable tech. But I really want to encourage you guys to please creatively misuse this technology. This stuff kind of sucks. And I think that it makes us like worship data, right? And Data worship is, it's, it's okay, like yeah, we have all these sensors, we can, we can be tracking our heart rate and our steps constantly, um, but then we're kind of told how to feel about that data by the company that made the thing, right? Nike makes the app and it tells you, or Fitbit says, you met your goal today according to our sensors, and it, it's just a little weird to have this like blind trust for these, uh, like let someone tell you how to feel about the data about your body, and then they're probably collecting it, you don't know, and using it for... Who knows what? So I think it's really important to creatively misuse technology that's out there now um, so that we can like break those molds and all that fun stuff. Um, Snowden did just say, I wrote it down when he said it, the technology enables dissent. And wearables are a great way to show everybody else what that means because you wear them out on your person and it's ex expression of your beliefs. I will close with this with no comment. Thank you very much. If you'd like to contact me, I'm here. I have a live show on YouTube every week talking about wearable electronics. You can ask me questions. If we have time now, I'm checking my clock. If we have time now, um, I think the next one's supposed to start at five. I, I'd like to take a couple questions if there are any in the audience. See, there's, a, there's a crowd mic in the middle. Is to let you know when, you're, when your RFID is being read without your consent? Um, I think it's a great detector. For example, if you've got Easy Pass in New York, if you saw a puking monkey's talk, um, um, it's being read for a lot of different reasons that do not have anything to do with the terms of service. And this would, would not silently let you know that. That's a great point. That's another reason I really want to order them online right now. I got a question. Yeah. Um, why should we, as people who build technology, allow uh, making something fashionable be make it look like a 20th century non-technological piece of apparel why not create a new aesthetic where we're proud to show off the fact that we're wearing technology yeah i guess what i'm trying to say is you don't have to make it look like that to be fashionable you we have to we have to make our technology fashionable and palatable to a broader audience by making it express different types of personal style not just diane von furstenberg or raspberry pi guy but all the way in between so I know that, that there's several people out here who are helping to make that happen. I'm trying. Could I put a, I, could I put a finer point on it? Sorry for asking two questions. Uh, to, what, to, to what extent is fashion created by precedent of what people are wearing now? And to what extent is it created by the actions of advertisers and the media and the guys who actually do the design? 
Fashion is highly influenced by advertising. It's true, but whatever you're wearing right now is already out of style. So, like, fashion is always overturning. There's there's interesting parallels between intellectual property of open source hardware and fashion, right? Because they don't have copyright on fashion design. So, as soon as they release something, it's already been knocked off and in department stores. So, they need to they need to uh, push for the new aesthetic. So, I would encourage you. You're already doing it, man. Um, pushing the new aesthetic and uh, and helping make that. I mean, I'm just talking about reaching a, w a wider audience. I don't mean to say that in, suggest that you have to comply, but it's interesting to see fashion designers, fashion companies become tech companies, right? Hello, uh, I like all your videos online. Um, aside from fashion, what do you think uh, is required to accelerate the adoption of wearable technologies? I think uh, my job at Adafruit is I'm doing that, right? I'm trying really hard to um, make like teenagers want to learn how to program because they want their prom dress to light up when they dance. I think that's really important. Education and tutorials about technology and, and uh, showing, because people need to be inspired and so in, in making projects that inspire a new group of people who might not have been exposed to the idea that they can create their own technology. Uh, specifically, uh, I focus, I don't know, I like the teenage girls because I was one. Thank you. Hey, uh, great talk. Um, so in healthcare, with some of these newer emerging like uh, wearable healthcare devices that consumers are buying, things like not not just like activity monitors, but even some of these glucose monitors and and things like that. What, what do you think that that does for like the social contract between care providers and patients now? Like where, where's that 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 social contract going to start changing? What do you mean by social contract? Like, like it is, that the doctor's telling you it's okay to wear this thing all the time? Yeah, I mean, it's not something that's going to be prescription based. I mean, it's going to be something that's con consumer. Yeah, I think so. that is cool. And insulin insulin pumps are becoming. I had a student one time um, who was diabetic and had an insulin pump, and she she wanted to make um, like fashion accessories for the insulin pump, which would crafty ones like there's big fabric flowers and stuff um, that sort of like made her feel good about and fashionable about her. Uh, medically prescribed device, but medicine's hard. It's hard to get devices approved um, for for patient use, and so I think it, it takes things go a lot slower in the medical world when you're talking about new new advancements in in technology and making things more like body friendly or or, or like you know because if you're prescribed that device, then you're not choosing to wear it as part of your personal expression. You need it to live. Um, I think we're going to see more like you know cooler options um, I hate to say it but like more color options is the way it's going right now um, and uh, and we'll see DIYers uh, fashionably incorporate them into their uh, like the more people who are wearing devices the more fashionable they become so like with Apple and their newest uh, health kit um, API that they're adding to some of their devices and their forthcoming smartwatch do you think that there's gonna be a lot of rather than just the industry driving it there's gonna be a lot of consumers really driving to push this stuff into each other's pockets sure Especially. and it's hard in medicine like when patients ask hey give me this in a more girly color like that's not gonna happen but from but uh, for companies like Apple that definitely yeah consumer push will definitely have some kind of impact but that's hard in medicine thank you so you spoke about NFC and RFID and I chipped myself a while ago so I was wondering if you could just talk about the intersection of sort of wearable and how you think that might interplay with that? How wearables might interplay with what? With like, implants? I, yeah. Well, like for you, I think it's interesting too because like Mikey Sklar like chipped himself many years ago and had a video, fam famous video online of the home surgery where he did it. And um, and like and then many many years later, the video where I put the RFID tag in my nail polish is popular. And you haven't seen like I've seen other people do it before, but it's like it wasn't as popular. And I think it's because like d technology is a male dominated field, right? And so and you guys don't wear nail polish that much. So um, I think that like uh, that touches on my point of of wearable tech going invisible or more fashionable. Right, like either it's completely hidden inside your nail polish, or inside your hand, or it's and you wear it as an overt expression of your of yourself. I put mine in clear nail polish because I like the way it looked. All right, thanks. That's time, guys. Sorry. If I'll be around for a few minutes, if you want to come chat. Thank you so much.
I'll go into how many are online and how many aren't. Do I have everything? No, I need my power adapter, and then I'd be happy to come chat with you. No laptop audio. Do you guys have uh, VGA or, 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 or HDMI? Uh, I'll talk to the video again. Okay. okay. Well, I mean, the plug. All right, there's the plug. All right. But you just need two mics, that's it. No, no, I don't need two mics. I have my mic. Okay. No, 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 I just wanted to make sure. You betcha. Well, we'll, yeah. But light look, is, is interesting and in the way. Wow. I know, right? If you stand right here, it's not so Well, bad. I was going to run into the audience, but apparently they're scared of that. Isn't that interesting? Good job. I'll talk Thank to you later. You. I'm doing, um, there's, there are two things to care about in this world. One of them is um, the sound and one is the video. I have no sound coming out of this laptop. I am idly thinking of going into the audience with a microphone. I wanted to go and do a quick test with it to see if it, there's a feedback button I'll say up here. Um, and then the other one is I'm going from HDMI into a converter into this and normally that works. Every once in a while I've had, if, if what, Yes, and the, but the thing is, is and but one thing I did discover is that, uh, yeah, one thing I did discover is that, um, um, one thing I did discover, and, and we'll find, yeah, we'll find, yes, one thing I did discover is that if it's actually a VGA that converts back down to an HDMI, the signals blow through the VGA enough to crash my system. I don't think you've got that problem. But I'm just saying, that's something I worry about. Um, so it sounds, I would love... No, there's no, there's no VGA, we're just talking about video Exactly. We're not going to show anything, especially your laptop. Well, I'm, I'm going to, in one... In, well, whatever it's using, it's using. Like, it's doing it. I mean, we'll find out. Um, I would, I, I'll walk over and look. Just avoid, don't hang out in front of the speakers. Try to stay towards the middle. Right. And speak as loudly as you can. Yep. Um, and then I can keep the game lower. Windows 7. So. That should let you do it then. Oh, it'll, yeah, I mean, it'll do it. Let's just, let's see what happens, right? So, uh, screen, resolution. screen resolution. And then. The lowest of the low. Okay. There you go. And say okay. Yep. Let's see what happens. Keep changes. Keep changes. Okay. Um.
Is this actually working? Okay, everyone. Well, we work out just a month. No, no, turn that fucking thing off in my face. I, um, I, I, we're just fixing just a little video thing because once again, computers hate each other. So we're just going to do that for a couple, just a minute or two, but then we'll go. So if that's what, what you're seeing, we're just going to make that happen. So thanks a lot. All right. So. Hacking. No, it's not. Um, and, uh, so let's say.
while we're getting this worked out, oh, it's down. While we're getting this worked out, just a couple of quick announcements. Ooh. We're waiting. Well, uh, Jason is getting this worked out. A couple of quick announcements uh, that, that some of you heard already. Lightning, uh, lightning talks are starting right now. Of course, you're here, so don't get up and run over there. But you might want to go afterwards. Lightning talks are starting in the U room uh, at 5 p.m. We are officially one hour behind on our schedule. We'll uh, stay that way for the rest of the evening, so everything's just an hour late. Uh, we got a request from the hotel. Please do consider removing trash when you leave the room and throw it in the bins towards the back of the room. And... Um, uh, there you go. So, oh, and also one other one. There's a uh, concert tonight, 10 p.m. That's going to be a lot of fun. Some people saw the concert last night. We liked it so much. We're going to have it again or something similar to that tonight. It's actually involving live mixing or mixing of live radio, live mixing of live radio. And I think we're almost ready, but not quite. So stay tuned. But those are the announcements. We'll do the intro momentarily. Is this working? Turn that up. Is that going? Is that going at all? How about now? Is it working? Is it working? Hi, everybody. Hi, thank you for being so patient. Thank you for being so patient. I know you're, here's, here's the great thing. You're looking at this screen here. Oh, hello, friend. You're looking at this screen here, and you're like, I'm having trouble seeing what's up there. You're not alone. I just wanted to warn you, you, you do not have some sort of ocular degeneration. My slides will have to be put up at some other point. Right now, just think of this as sort of artwork that goes between my lyrical voice that comes out. So um, my name is Jason Scott. How many people have seen talks by me before? Nice number. All right, the rest of you, you made a mistake. So the name of this talk is, like, did you want to do the, here, just You're good. Uh, this is Jason Scott, Text Files. So. So this is the DECSS case. Um, this is, um, I'm gonna describe it, but I just wanted you to see this pile of documents. Um, these are all the documents related to a court case. This would be all the testimony that was entered in across the six day trial. Um, this would be the uh, fuck you. Uh, this would be the, no, seriously, fuck you. Um, this would be the please, are you sure you say fuck you, to which this was the fuck you. So that's legal terminology. I just wanted to make sure you knew about it. I'm, I'm, I'm a veteran of talking, and so I'm really not one to buy into a lot of the stay up in front. And anyway, you guys have been enjoying an ironic Big Brother presentation by Snowden. So there's really no reason for me to do the same thing. So I hope you all don't mind that things are a little more interactive than they need to be. It's been two years since my, it's been two years since my last talk, so yay. Um, <laughs> So, Hollywood has a secret. Um, Hollywood has a secret, and here's the secret, okay? If you take a image of a guy or a girl, and then you show a picture of the opposite sex, um, and then you switch back to the first one, the audience will immediately decide that that person lusts, is watching, or is otherwise in the same physical space as the other person. In other words, the pictures sit quietly and we do all the work. And the reason why is because we're human beings and when you see something disappear into a rock, you know it's probably going to come out again. And when you see it the other side, you go, oh, it's out again, I'm gonna eat it. Um, and so, so we're, we're kind of wired this way. We draw conclusions, we put things aside, that's what we do. And Hollywood, long ago, discovered that 
by putting these images together and hosting them somewhere, they could pull people out of their otherwise wretched and terrible lives and make them feel like they were someplace else. And over time, they refined that, but I often did it by giving you the same picture of the guy, looking at the picture of the girl, looking back at the picture of the guy. They quickly refined it to a picture of a car chasing after another car in which the guy in the front car was someone you liked and someone behind it was someone you didn't like. We have other stories too, not many, but this is what the secret was. The secret was the product inside is not that special. But if you're the only game in town and you work hard to make yourself the only game in town, then that product is the product and it's fantastic, and people will write film criticism about it, and everyone will be happy. So this is about a court case, and um, the court case is called uh, Ramirez, uh, well, technically Universal versus Ramirez, um, but many people call, call it the DECSS case. That looks terrible. How ironic that something about visual data being unencrypted looks so terrible, <laughs> thwarted by HDMI. I like that. I like that, I like the irony. I'm gonna go with the irony, I'm gonna go with irony. Um, and so, <laughs> well, so this is about a court case, but it's not about a court case. Because court cases are boring. Court cases aren't interesting unless you're in them. And what you really wanna do is you wanna look at what happened in a court case, and then you wanna figure out what can you learn from it? What do we learn for it? Or we'll just keep recycling the same problems, like we recycle the same talks, like we recycle the same movies. So let's try to learn something new from this crazy, dumb thing. One day I got a phone call, and I got a phone call, I mean, it was actually, a, well, yeah, I got a phone, it was basically um, Emmanuel Goldstein, who for the purposes of this talk, we'll call Eric Corley, and who um, wanted me to talk with the EFF because the EFF had a storage unit, and the storage unit was full of old EFF stuff and they had hit the term limit. It had been like 10 years that this stuff had been sitting in there, and they said, we want to get rid of it. And they, and they contacted the people who were in some of the cases to go, what do we do with the old junk from your case? In this case, it was for the DECSS case, and Eric Corley had been involved in that, and he said basically, you should give it to Jason Scott, and contacted me. And I said, fantastic, and I waited eagerly by my mailbox for it. Five months later, while I was on my way on a vacation trip, a truck pulled up with a lot of boxes, and I was leaving in two hours. Desperate, as you can see it's winter, my brother and I stacked it up and put plastic over it to protect it from the wind. And I also knew I didn't really have much place for this. I didn't have much space in my shipping container. Yes, I have a shipping container. And so I did the best thing to do, which was put it out on the internet with violins playing, going, this is history. Look where history is very cold. And waited eagerly for somebody to go, oh, history, we'll give you a warm cup of coffee and a little mug and let you sit by the fire. Inside, I printed some pictures. What you're looking at here is some, some hash mark, some hash and some encrypted files printed out for pages and pages. This is IRC discussions about DVDs printed by the Ream. There were 75 boxes of material sealed up with obscure markings outside, only some of which caused me the twitch with names like defendant and uh, plaintiff's complaint and injunction. And inside, of course, was this whole thing about you know history and, and I always love these little moments, like this little transcription from the thing where the guy has to spell what Google is. You know, do you go to any besides Hotbot? Yeah, actually I went to Google, G-O-O-G-L-E. So I knew this was like weirdly historical and strange. And things like, I don't know, hard clipping a, f a floppy disk to a piece of paper as a way to indicate the work had been done. Anyway, it was, good. It, was good. it was good to have this sort of historical data, and I collect a lot of historical data, and I thought that was kind of interesting, right? Well, it was the, um, the Potters, um, um, Heidi and, and Bruce, who stepped forward and said, we'll take it. And I drove a truck of 75 boxes down to their storage area, actually their garage, and loaded them up, 
barely having cracked one. But they took it. So God bless them. They took them and saved them. And that's where it ends, right? That's where it ends. This thing that was lonely found a home somewhere in, in, in the Washington, D.C. area and was soon to live an endless nothing life, once again stored away in the darkness of history and forgotten. But no. What it was, in fact, was something like this. So this is a quote from Isaac Newton. Um, Isaac Newton, you know, he's, he was a pretty intense dude. This was a guy who invented calculus to win a bet, right, when he was 27. That's the source of that whole, we got a badass here quote when he talks about it, because he's talking about the fact that to win a bet, he invents calculus to prove what he's saying. And you're reading, you're not going to get this right off. Some of you will, and God bless you. But are not gross bodies and light controvertible into one another, and may not bodies receive much of their activity from the particles of light which enter into their composition? This is the beginning of the nuclear bomb. This is when human beings start figuring out that shit can blow up really fast, faster than we expect. And if we trigger off things, we will explode. It took a few years from 1706, but he was sitting around. I'll bet you he invented direct messaging too. I'm just going to tell you that now. Many of you might know about the 2600 case, the DECSS case, the DVD case. Uh, Universal et al. versus Ramirez et al. It all has different names. Some of you may remember it with the snap trap memory of some geek, or some of you might actually be completely unsure what it is other than it was bad. You may not even know what the verdict was. I'm not going to poll why I do that to you. But sitting on 2600 are the collections of PDFs of all the official stuff. In other words, the PDF version of this material. Um, it's all sitting up there. So if you're the kind of person who wants to read through it line by line, knock yourself out. Knock out everyone around you. Read at home on the way to work while driving. Just do it. Have fun. <laughs> all right. So, so basically, you know, you have these wonderful legal terms like appellate reply brief and, and so on. And, and I'll go into what the case was. But, you know, that's what it sits right now. A bunch of PDFs of the officially released things. Right. Or you can go onto Wikipedia and read kind of their description of what this case was. And, you know, so, so, so basically here's what happened, right? There's this thing called the DVD spec, right, which was created to allow digital video discs, which were a form of digital entertainment. They were plastic pieces of discs. I have to say this because some of you are young. <laughs> and they basically allowed you to store a certain amount of material on them in a digital form and, and allow a relatively simple player at the time to be able to not just play it, but be able to read menus from it, have subtitles, do a bunch of different video things. And in theory, the clarity was unbelievable and heretofore unseen on Earth and cheap to produce over time. Well, it depended on a protection scheme of some sort. Hmm, mysterious and wonderful. Some sort of black box that sat inside of a chip and made it better unless you were bad, and then it made it worse. And that's what it did. And somebody, somebody came up with a way to read it regardless of that quote-unquote protection. Given, the reason given was, hey, there's no good DVD players for Linux. So you can't play DVDs on Linux, let's fix that. And so over the course of time, this thing came out, and a utility was created by a, a young gentleman uh, Mr. Johansson, who basically allowed you to do it. It was called the DECSS Utility because this was the content scrambling system. Fantastic name, which enabled you to basically unread. Isn't that great? There it is. It's a little blurry, but there it is. Um, this is the terrible thing. You run it and combine with other things, it allows you to read a DVD and not worry about the content scrambling system. The program is very small, and it was linked everywhere. And what ended up happening was people um, put it everywhere because it was amazing and weird and interesting. I don't know how many of them understood it, but it went out there and it went everywhere. And so, as they say, the movie studios sued. And they sued a few people for it. And that was celebrated. It was, oh my god, we pissed them off. And they sued a bunch of people, citing the, the newly minted, you know, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, 1998, which enabled a whole variety of things to happen. And 
this code was everywhere, hosted everywhere, including at 2600 Magazine. So the movie studios sued a bunch of people, including Eric Corley himself and his, later his magazine, 2600, for having this. They sought injunctive relief, they wanted many thousands of dollars, and of course they wanted him permanently banned from ever distributing this. So he took it down as per the request and instead replaced it with a list of mirrors. <laughs> that's, our, that's, our, that's our manual. Just, just kicks you in the balls while being let out of the club. And so it ended up um, being linked and they sued him over that. They said, you can't even link to a thing that does something bad, which was a very interesting innovation legally. And so, you know, when you have a, um, when you have a court case like that, of course, it's got the geeks versus the old school versus everything else. It was a six day trial after months of preparation and it was found to be not in 2600's favor. Uh, the other defendants all settled. 2600 fought on, as they are wont to do, and they lost. So they appealed, and in a grand decision, they also agreed. So the case was a loss. It was a blow uh, against free speech in some definitions. It was definitely a blow against 2600. Luckily, there were no monetary damages applied. But the, 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 uh, the judge in it, Judge Kaplan, in a 80 plus page ruling, which is in there, says basically, no, we have to maintain what the movies are, because the movies are very special. And we don't want people to stop getting movies about a guy looking at a girl. Now, the whole thing about copyright, I, I mean, you know, I love talking about that debate. Here's an 1880 declaration of copyright on corn harvesters. Um, and a warning against the people who are pirating corn harvesters. Um, don't do it. Only get the good ones. You'll be liable for damages if you make, sell, or use infringing machines that make corn. <laughs> so we've been angry a long time where somebody goes, blah, don't steal my shit. I have a thing on it that says no. We've been doing this a long time, right? Um, so the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was simply an extension of that idea. It said, okay, now there's all these different things we're going to do that are digital. So that's weird. Wow, you have the ability to make something do, make co infinite copies of itself. Well, that breaks something. You also have the ability for it to be perfect every time. You have the ability for it to be passed everywhere simply. Well, here's a bunch of laws saying that's all kind of bad. And it's been improved upon over time. You know, in this country, if you videotape a movie, well, let's say you use a digital camera, but let's go with videotape. I like that better. Let's say you take in an RCA Panasonic VHS <laughs> camera and you walk in and you record the Expendables 3. And for some reason, the gendarmes in their little fucking red vests walk up and grab you. How many years are you liable for? Five. You get off easy. Yeah, five. Record a movie, five years of jail. $250,000 fine. That's very important to this country. We are a country where if you record something off a screen, you are liable for five years of prison. $250,000. This must be really friggin' important. This must be the golden child. It's because of the Motion Picture Association of America. Um, they, are, they have a perfect right to exist, and what they do and they get involved in makes sense. What they are is all of the motion picture and Hollywood firms kind of don't like each other. They really kind of don't, but they all agree they have things they agree upon that need to be enforced and looked at and, and, and lobbied for, but the problem is, is that they never want to sit in each other's goddamn office. So why not have an office that they all agree that they'll listen to. And that's the Motion Picture Association of America. They created the rating system, for instance. They were the ones who uh, you know, certify different kinds of sound. They're the ones that dictate what the size of a screen is. They, 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 they involve themselves in all sorts of intercompany processes in motion pictures. But they also deal in enforcement. 
And they've gone a little more than enforcement. They've actually worked into going, wow, this current society is not ready to protect our stuff to the level we want. What can we do to warp reality to our needs?